Welcome to the Indie Opera Podcast. Welcome to the Indie Opera Podcast. This is Peter, and we're joined by. <laughs> you know we're joined by. We're joined by. You know that was that. that was really smooth. That was that went really well. <laughs> <laughs> you should say this is Peter. This is Professor Walker. Craig. And All right, then... do I try it again? <laughs> no, let's keep going. Just oh, okay, you and are, I'm bro. Walker. And, uh... and, I'm, and I'm Craig. <laughs> and I'm Sarah. <laughs> Sarah's wearing a t-shirt that says, I'm not with these idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm with know her. <laughs> <laughs> so we're joined today by Sarah Frazier, who, who is an artist manager with Fletcher Artists Management. Um, and also Greg Moonji, who we've talked about quite a bit, who is our musicologist slash a uh, great writer who's been doing these incredible things on our website as well. And I would, we were trying to figure out a way to get him on the show. And this is actually great. Um, so uh, welcome to the show, Gregory. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so glad to have you on. Cool. We, we look forward to reading uh, your review of this podcast. <laughs> over. Well, Please. Please well, make us all look good in your review. It is. <laughs> I, I look forward to reviewing it because I've never had the chance to review a comedy of errors before. <laughs> a comedy of errors. <laughs> yeah. Well, we that. <laughs> We're definitely that. <laughs> so I see Brooke in, is drinking. What are you drinking? This is bullet bourbon. <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> So we're gonna this, this time this, of COVID nineteen bullet cheers. bourbon is your best friend, especially if you live alone like I do. Cheers. <laughs> cheers. I'm iced tea, sorry. And it talks from the inside. What what are you drinking, Sarah? This is a uh, petite chablis, because I'm pretending to be classy. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I don't know, whatever my husband ordered from the liquor store that got delivered. So I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> well, liquor stores are essential. So they yeah. are an essential business right now. They yeah. are. I, I wish I knew we would all be drinking because if not, I would have asked for a Guinness from the store. So I you drink Guinness? <laughs> and, uh, this is a simple discussion for. Later on, I'm more of a wine kind of a guy, but yeah, I, I, I drink Guinness when I am in the mood for me. <laughs> so do you go, do you, when you go to the Met, do you drink when you're there? Only if the production is really, really bad. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, like the, the last time I saw this time when you go there, I, I was, I swear this is real, I was sitting behind this couple that were on like a, a date, I guess, and uh, the husband or uh, boyfriend leaned over to his uh, partner and he said, um, next time we come to this, Make sure I will die because that way, if the singing is great and the orchestra is superb, I can at least cover my eyes because this production is just so, so bad. I was like, I was like, I don't know you, but I, I, I like it. <laughs> oh, man, opera 
sense. sense. Are you sure you haven't been drinking? Oh my God. <laughs> this is definitely crazy podcast. This is definitely one of my favorite parts of our programming. It's just to hear everyone complain about it. <laughs> <laughs> the favorite, your favorite part is listening to people complain. Well, yes. Of course. <laughs> That's solid. I I definitely like. I love sitting in family circle because you hear all the crazies ranting about whatever. Oh yeah. The best. Well, but mm -hmm. people in family circle actually usually know what they're talking about. Right, but they're also mm -hmm. angry. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, and they know what they're talking about. Poorly mannered. Oh yeah. I have a way of cheating the system. I realize that standing room tickets. Are way cheaper than the actual seat. And if I ask for a handicap start in standing room, I can pay for the cheaper ticket without, you know, uh, <laughs> needing to stand for a four hour bug or whatever. So that's how you go to all these shows, is you get right. standing room? Yeah, I get, <laughs> I get standing room tickets, but I didn't realize until I started doing it that it's, it's only its own little ecosystem back in there. Right? <laughs> well, now you've outed yourself as a scammer, Greg, so. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. I, I would do the same thing. So it makes, makes perfect sense. Yeah. People, people who already who know me well already know that, and I figure that my age, my type of wife, and my, uh, I might as well let all of the internet and the podcast universe know that I love a good cigar anyway, so why not? Why not let everyone know? <laughs> <laughs> So now listen, guys, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, what's going on in the universe, okay? So Sarah, I know that you are an artist management uh, position, so you know, you've worked with the conductors and the producers and the singers. So give us a little bit of a, I mean, other than the obvious, but tell us a little bit about how people are dealing and, and do people feel optimistic or is it just all crazy out there? It's, it's been a, a pretty wild roller coaster of the last few weeks like that like almost exactly three weeks ago was kind of when everything crashed and burned and came to a, a, a grinding halt um and there have been a few really hard days since then um and and now that we're kind of past this initial phase of just everything being canceled um you know some of the summer festivals have been sending out really positive messages about how um, you know, they're continuing to plan as if their regular summer festival season is going to happen as scheduled. And, um, and, and a couple of them, you know, like Des Moines Metro Opera has publicly announced that um, no matter what happens, they're going to be, you know, uh, paying artists in full whether or not they're actually able to have a season, which has been um, just a really positive note that yeah, shows bravo. just how much they value artists. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, people are starting to now plan ahead. Um, you know, people are talking about rescheduling things that have been canceled. And um, also, we're just getting inquiries for future seasons about artists, which is, you know, kind of a bright spot in our day whenever somebody actually writes us saying like, hey, what is this person doing in, you know, the 21-22 season during this time? And that's just really refreshing to hear right now that people are you know, assuming that our lives will go back to normal at some point and, uh, and that we're able to kind of focus on those things. So in that sense, that's been really heartening um, because I know that companies need to feel that as much as our artists and other managers do. Like we're all needing to feel that we can get back to something kind of back to normal. Um, so that's been encouraging. So, I mean, I, I'm going to embarrass myself a little. I listen to podcasts about Disney, Disney World and stuff like that. They've been actually, they even though they closed all the parks and all that, they're actually yeah. going to pay the cast 
through uh, for a couple months, uh, oh. even though they, they aren't working, which I think is really beautiful. Yeah. Um, there are some companies are going out of their way to at least show their, you know, their support. Yeah. Um, it's kind of depended on the size of the company and, and whether or not, like if folks have been either in performances or in rehearsals, if they're in performances, many companies, it, at least the ones that are able to, I understand it's not possible for every company. Um, a lot have been paying at least, you know, a remainder of a performance fee. If companies have been in rehearsals when they've had to cancel things, some of them have been paying at least half of the fee. Um, you know, further out for folks who haven't started rehearsals, um, the general consensus so far has been 20 or 25 percent, and then hopefully um, being able to reschedule then for future seasons. And so, again, that's been really heartening. I mean, again, I know it's not possible for all companies to be able to do that, as we've seen with some of the larger companies, um, such as the Met, et cetera. Um, but what, what is know, the Met doing? Are they do they, they have invoked for force majeure and are say that again force majeure sorry let me know it's a that. it's a contractual thing basically saying like if there's you know a famine or act of god or earthquake or pandemic that they can cancel the contract and basically not have to pay anybody anything uh, oh so, that's sad that's terrible it's it's also, it's like you have the most resources and they're not I and mean, then people like des moines metro opera are are treating their their artists with a lot more generosity seems like I mean and I and I'm not gonna get into specifics about who's doing what and how great or how bad that is but um I mean I know it's hard for some companies based on the size of their endowments and what they're actually able to do for people and there's also a lot of um like liability and insurance things at stake regarding whether or not they invoke force measure um and then, and then also, um, yeah, so things like that that kind of determine whether or not they're actually able to try and help artists. Um, and it, it sucks. And these companies that have had to do that know that it sucks. And they're um, still trying to find other ways to help and raise funds, um, even if they aren't able to pay artists fees. So, I mean, that's always appreciated. Um, but, it, you know, it stinks that they have to do that. But because of these other, even other things like, um, their unions, there may be uh, things at stake with other with multiple unions like they have at the Met. Um, there's just a lot of different factors at stake that determines whether or not they can invoke force majeure and what that means when they do it. So uh -huh. it's, it's tough. <clears throat> so uh, speaking of things that were canceled, um, the Intimate Apparel, which we talked about in last show, um, is going, they said that they are going to remount the production this fall. Yes. Would I really help in doing? Because I saw it in previews. You saw it in previews? Yeah, it was the last thing I saw. It was a week before everything went to went to part. And right. it was it was really um, a really great show and uh, I think it's a story that really needs to be I'm really happy that the, the um, collaboration between the Met and the Lincoln Center Theater is uh, producing some good work. Yeah, I mean, this was also it, similar to what they did for Nico Muley, where they put it on the stage. They decided that that particular piece, Intimate Apparel, would work better in a theater, smaller theater space. <clears throat> So it's the same sort of arrangement there, there, there I think, isn't that? Um, it's, it's similar. Yeah. Supposedly the Met isn't really, I mean, the Met is kind of involved in, at least they were helping with some of the workshops and things, um, but it's, it's kind of become its own beast over at Lincoln Center Theater. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad, first of all, that they were, um, after it was canceled, they um, were paying artists through um, the original date that they had to um, cancel shows uh, through, I think it was April 13th, 12th, 13th. Um, so they paid artists through that date, which was great. And now that they're, they're looking at rescheduling for the fall. So I had a couple clients in that show. So I was really bummed that I wasn't able to make it to one of, I was supposed to go to a preview on 
Saturday, what was it, March 14th, and they canceled <laughs> like the day before. Oh, <laughs> uh, so, so that was a bummer. <laughs> so how does that work? They're paying them through the run of the show April 13th, and then what? Ha when they do the show in the fall, do they not get paid? They they only uh, the run was supposed to go through May. Oh, um, I see. So um, so when they pick that up, then they'll it will continue as as if it were going as normal. I see. Interesting. Well, I think I think I, it will technically still be in previews. I'm not sure. I'm things still have to be worked out, of course, like with the actual fall dates and stuff. But um, I think it would still be in previews, and then there's still an official opening to be had. Right. Mm. And how are the how are artists doing in general now? Are 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 artists getting really desperate and panicky? I mean, with with so many things. I mean, being canceled or how, how are they, what are they like going doing other things to make money or what what are what are they doing yeah i mean luckily um you know the rules have kind of been changed so that um like 1099 employees uh freelancers can can now file for unemployment um so we've helped a couple of artists with you know get that information um that's been you know a good recourse for a lot of them since they have absolutely no income right now um helping them file for that um i know some people who are looking at other work like remote work um etc whatever they can do to kind of make ends meet um you know relying on those savings um you know the first couple of weeks again were super hard and i know a lot of artists you know the cancellations keep rolling in for some of them and that's really disheartening. Um, but then, you know, a lot of folks have been creating a lot of art in the last few weeks too. So that's been, re been really wonderful to see, so. <laughs> so I'll use that as a perfect segue to what I wanted to mention. So the, um, you know, I had been organizing the New York Opera Fest um, and basically because of all of this, uh, we're changing the New York Opera Fest to be the New York Virtual Opera Fest. And it's not going to have any time frame. We're going to just start now because there are things happening virtually online. I'm building a website as we speak. <laughs> but um, we are American Opera Projects, Beth Morrison Projects, Collectio Musicorum, Dell'Arte, Heartbeat, Here Art Center, New Camerata, On Site Opera, Opera on Tap, Regina Opera, Untitled Theater Company, Victor Herbert Renaissance Project have all created digital content. And I will be making a, a calendar so people, some of these things are going to be happening weekly, but we already have, I think we have over 40 things planned. Amazing. Um, just in April. Uh, so there's a lot of arts for people to check out in the New York area, plus the entire uh, world. There, a lot of companies are opening up and doing virtual things. Um, <clears throat> Brooke, have you heard about that stuff? Oh yeah, I mean, I get, I, I'm, it's actually overwhelming the volume of uh, creative output that shows up in like my Facebook feed and various sources of social media. Um, people are, in addition to like companies making this stuff available to their customers and their, you know, their audiences, individual artists are creating things in their living rooms. Um, I've seen some very, I watched a La Chirada La Mano um, that they, Isabel Leonard and I'm an asshole and I can't remember the guy's name because <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible with names, but they made like, they were on the phone. It was like, you know, the pianist is in the bottom and the, the two singers in, in the video, like they're, people are doing creative things to try to, I mean, her, her, partly for a creative outlet for themselves, I think. Um, and also because, you know, it's something people are captive audiences and are, are starved for things to do that are outside watching, you know, watching Law & Order SVU on Netflix again. Um, or on, that's actually <laughs> Hulu, sorry. Law & Order SVU is on Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started watching N, uh, NCIS. Anyway. Oh, really? Yeah. I. I, I just realized there's a lot of episodes, so might as well. Um, <laughs> a lot. But uh, I also started to watch, the Met was showing the ring cycle. I made it through um, the first one. The second one, I made it about an hour and a half, and I realized, you know, they only made it go live at 6.30. It wasn't going to be done till really late. So <laughs> I just couldn't sit through it. It was like the shortest one. <laughs> but by Kurt, no, the first the first one was about two and a half hours. The second one was four hours. 
But you can watch it the next day also, right? Yeah, it's like I'm hours. actually working yeah. during the day. You Do you not have the Met Player, Peter? You can just watch anything whenever you want to watch it. I don't have the Met Player. How much is it? It's like $15 a month. It's like any other streaming service, basically. Yeah, so many streaming. Oh, I know. Millionaire's I Brook. <laughs> well, yeah, we're not made of money like you, bro. Yeah. Bread, right. not not it, though. She lives in an art gallery. Look at her. <laughs> I know. She lives in the Metropolitan Museum. I mean, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Met Player. I mean, for those of you who want to subscribe to yet another streaming service, uh, the Met Player does have, you know, hundreds of operas that you can watch. There. No, that's been great. I've really enjoyed all of their their uh, free content over the last couple of weeks. I actually sat through most of Tannhäuser. Oh wow! So I was very proud of myself for that, and also Meisterzinger. So oh, it was. Weird. It really was a whole Wagner week. Ooh, you know, that, I like seeing epic. it. Epic Meisterzinger! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I yeah. like seeing it in person. I don't know. It's hard when. I don't know. And I got to see Meisterzinger the last time it came through. Yeah. Um, and that, I, I don't remember how, I think, well, one of my clients was in it and I had a ticket in like the sixth row in the center. So it was just getting my face blasted off the whole time. It was amazing. <laughs> also, I got to do that for, um, for Valkyra last year because I work with one of the Valkyries and uh, wound up like for the dress rehearsal, like fourth row directly in front of all of the brass. So during the ride of the Valkyries, like I just got my face melted off. It was amazing. <laughs> it was like the most metal thing an opera could possibly be. Heavy metal, heavy metal yeah. opera. But yeah. Valkyrie is like the one. It is, the it one. is. <laughs> of the cycle, that's the one. Yep. So Sarah, you, you're actually a singer, right? That is my background. And then I got a master's in uh, stage directing. So I and spent a few years uh directing and assistant directing before i got into artist management that's so. actually how so, i met sarah yeah really? okay. 2013. Mm -hmm. we did a traviata together where she, yep. traviata. where north yeah it was traviata yeah in north shore it was in a castle on long island it was amazing oh yeah. that's so cool yeah it was very fun <laughs> shout out to dan klein <laughs> right yeah hey dan klein so i did so you got a master's in opera directing Right? Yes, Florida State. That's, that's, that's pretty interesting. That's, that's not a, a very common uh, master's degree to it get. Specialized. There were only two of us in the program. I was going to ask how big is the program? <laughs> <laughs> so I got lots of hands-on experience. A lot, yeah. Stuff, so that's cool. <laughs> so you directed the ring cycle like eight times I while you were there? Yeah. <laughs> More like the Anna Russell condensed version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For outreach. Is, is there a kind of opera that you you liked directing? Oh, you know, I hmm, that's a good question. Comedy is harder to direct than drama, I think, and so I think I like that challenge a lot. Uh, nothing in terms of particular genres, really, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I'll I'll direct anything people want to hire me for. It's fine. <laughs> So, Walker, um, Walker, do you have something you like? She's a great director. <laughs> yes, yes. Hire Sarah. Walker, do you, is there a type of opera you prefer directing? I I do enjoy directing comedy a lot. I think it's <clears throat> I think it's really fun, and you you get to you get to work with the singers in a really unique way. So you don't get to work with them on you know on more dramatic material. Um, but then I also really I I I, I like directing new new opera probably probably the best new opera comedy opera and and like any anything 20th century is, is mm -hmm. my favorite like i love i love strauss and i love berg and um those 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 are all fun so i kind of like the, the extremes yeah. i guess of, of uh, i also love all opera. things chamber opera like give me all yeah. of benjamin Britten's chamber operas oh yeah i mean he's you, you the can't lose with that. Yeah, you can't lose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you also teach about opera business as well. You have workshops. I have done a couple of like seminars and workshops for people. Um, opera America has asked me to join them a few times for their feedback auditions, um, and then they they kind of package it with part of their sort of career blueprint seminar that they've done for the last few years, where they work with mostly sort of emerging artists and kind of try to 
teach them about the biz and get them to sort of become this full package. So they work with these younger artists on like getting their resumes in order, giving them really high quality recordings and uh, audio and video, um, getting websites up to date. And then they also bring in, you know, professionals from different parts of the field to talk about um, just sort of best practices. And uh, so I've gotten to join them a few times to talk about sort of the process of finding an agent and, and what that means and, and where sort of like what our place in the business is and, and how we can help them. So I've done a variety of things like that. And it's been really, it's really fulfilling for me to work with this sort of next generation of singers. I find that super fun. Do you think the, uh, this next generation of singers is coming more business savvy and more aware than when we graduated? I mean, for me personally, I think about all these opportunities that this generation has compared to um, when I was an undergrad and didn't have nearly the amount of resources that people have these days. Like, not that I was like born before the internet or anything, but you know, like people have- I think, some... Peter, I think Peter was born before the internet. <laughs> weren't, weren't you, is that right? I actually was. <laughs> the, I think all of us were. Weren't he we? was born before because yeah, he made it cool. Great, how cool. I remember when my parents first got the internet hooked up. I think it was like 1998 or something. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I remember I was dial up modem very well. And oh, yeah. Dial back up. Then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it really, I think the internet has changed opera a lot. The fact that you can go to YouTube and like look up Francesco Domano and hear the guy who plays San Rivero, like it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. Yeah, and, and I just think it's such an interesting thing the way artists are developing nowadays, now that they actually are able to see their history and get, you know, it's at their fingertips, because you used to have to buy a record or go to a library uh, to, to hear this stuff, or maybe you were lucky and had parents who were into it, you know? Um, but let me ask you about the, the business savvy of the, the newer newer kids coming out of college. So do you, do you feel like that they're more entrepreneurial than you were, Sarah, when, when you first came out, or? I think a lot of them are. I think they're more aware of of just the fact that they are a business. Um, yes, they're all very talented people, but also that if we want to, you know, survive this pandemic, you also have to be a business and uh, and like, you know, know how to do your quarterly taxes and, and, and things like that. And also, you know, like, yes, your website needs to be up to date and have recent audio and video so we know what you actually sound like. Um, you know, some of this seems really basic, but, you know, and a lot of kids, kids um, know this, but then there's those few that kind of like some of them come into these seminars and I'm kind of a bit blown away from time to time um, with just like the lack of awareness. Um, but overall, I would say um, this aspiring generation of singers um, is definitely more with it. Um, and knowledgeable about the business than like I was coming out of grad school. I had no idea. It was like summer programs. What's that? Yeah, my, my undergrad, they had one class each week called musicianship and one session in the entire four years that I was at college, they had someone talk about management and that is it. That's all we got. There was no support. There was nothing. I learned everything I knew about the opera business from New Forum for Classical Singers. Really? I did not learn anything from school. I, mean, I learned group. a tiny bit from school, but the old that old forum from like 2002 that was online yeah. until like 2018. I mean, it, I think it only recently came down, but it was this old like old internet forum style with like the threads that like cascaded. What a oh, double-edged sword. <laughs> yeah, and I learned, I mean, it was, you have to, you, you know, there was, it was, it was like an amazing resource where you could see the best and the worst of what the opera world had to offer. Mm -hmm. um, and so you learn to like, 
filter through all of that stuff and that but that is how i w without that resource i would not have known anything about anything <laughs> so, so wait I, a second <clears throat> so it was called the new form for classical singers just to yeah. I, the sound is incredible yeah. Uh, I think it's a Facebook group. Wait, yeah. There's, there's a Facebook group now, but it's not the same as what that, because that forum was ostensibly anonymous. I mean, you, it, people, some people were outed and it was, you know, if you spent enough time there, you could figure out who people were, but it was, you know, everybody had an avatar. They were not themselves necessarily. People had sock puppets. It was a crazy, it was like the, <laughs> of the internet. You remember when the internet was like that? When you could yeah. pretend that, you, when you thought you could pretend that no one knew who you were or whatever. <laughs> Remembering this, I was a high school debater and I also did debate in college. Um, and we also had a forum for high school debate and it was the nerdiest Thing that ever existed and I'm having like PTSD from it. <laughs> so on the on the Facebook it, it's now called the new new forum for classical singers. Yes. Um, but it's still they still go by NFCS. And NFCS now on yeah. Facebook. But and it, and it has 13,679 members right now. Something like that. Yes. Just letting people know. Yeah um, and it is all classical singers and people it, like in that industry. So not everybody sings opera per se. There's some like concert singers and church singers and recital singers and, you know, but classical singers is the idea. Um, it is a um, not necessarily warm, fuzzy place. So if you decide to sign up, be warned. <laughs> Sarah, so if there are there places that are similar or places that people should check out if they want to know more about the opera business and they didn't get the correct information when they were in college, like me, uh, <laughs> where, are, are there good uh, resources online? I would say one of the best resources opera singers have would probably be Opera America. Um, they have a lot of artist resources available. Um, in addition to, you know, like their career blueprint seminars and, and that sort of stuff, but they have a lot of resources devoted to uh, artist development. Um, so I highly recommend that as a jumping off point for a lot of singers, um, especially people starting out in the business who maybe don't have a ton of connections. Um, uh, that's, that's a, yeah, probably the best sort of jumping off point. Um, there are tons of um, summer festivals that have now really started to incorporate um, these other sort of like outside of just like singing and coachings and all of that they really work to try and bring in other professionals to talk about you know the the biz um, and uh, and and how singers need to like utilize you know these sort of business tools to help make themselves as successful as they can be so I always tell people who are, you know, they're not past sort of like that grad school or like emerging, profe emerging professional level, that if they haven't done like um, a summer program of a certain level um, that will actually have these sorts of, you know, classes and, and um, tools for them um, to, to try and, and see what they can um, get into, you know, to audition and see if they can get into a summer program or even just like a regular season young artist program um, that will help really like polish them and help turn them into like an actual professional as opposed to like a college student, you know, it kind of helps them bridge that gap from college student emerging professional to like actual professional, emerged right. professional. Right. So do you know any information about this summer's like Glimmer Glass or or Santa Fe, are they still, everything's? Um, Santa Fe actually um, sent out an email today, um, like a mass email saying that they are planning, um, that's not just like an inside thing, that's like literally on their, it was just on their mailing list, um, that they are, you know, pushing ahead full steam, like they are planning their regular summer festival, um, which is great because it's one of my favorite places to visit and get to go there for the, um, the big like industry week in the summer. Um, uh, and I really want to go back. So um, I, I don't know Glimmer Glass, what their plans are. I assume at this point they're moving ahead as normal. Um, I know OTSL is moving ahead as, you know, normally planned. So everybody is really kind of waiting, I think, 
especially for like in the next month to see kind of if we are able to turn the corner with this. Um, and, and like, I understand with people wanting to hold off and wait until we actually know, I know some companies have kind of gone ahead, not necessarily summer companies have gone ahead and, um, canceled things a little bit further out just because of concern, like obvious understandable concerns. And then some other folks are choosing to wait in case things do improve, um, before they decide to cancel. So I under, understand why people are choosing both ways at right. this point. And what, which way do you think it's going to go? Because, I mean, it seems like in New York, like, we might be turning a, a bit of a corner right now. I mean, I mean, like, the number, the, the jumps of cases seem to be getting smaller, but, but, on the, but in other parts of the country, they're shooting up. So, I mean, we, I mean it, could, it could be, like, we could be better off than a lot of parts of the country yeah, uh, I mean, in, I, in a few weeks or a month, you know. Yeah, um, I definitely think that's a possibility, and I... I am an optimist by nature, and so I am trying very hard to to put out all the good vibes that most of these summer festivals are are going to be able to happen as scheduled. While I'm, you know, hoping for the best, I'm also preparing for the worst, and you know that significant loss of commissions that that we would have if if that's the case. But um, I, I do hope that you know if people actually take sheltering at home seriously that we'll be able to turn the corner a little sooner and, and hopefully be able to have a semblance of a summer festival season. If not, then I know a lot of folks are planning on starting in the fall, you know, just, you know, planning for the best again, that the fall season will be able to start as planned. So. Right. Just, so now as far as like, see. like data uh, around the country, just, just to warn everybody, you know, we we will not really know when the peak of this has happened until well after it's done. It may have already happened, and, and it, it's all we know is what people are reporting, what the people are testing. So, what the real arc of the disease, we have no idea. Um, yeah. There's some encouraging uh, results with like internet-enabled thermometers, which show that the moment you start socially isolating, it really does affect things. So, I'm hope I'm I want to think hopefully that maybe. Things have changed drastically, but it looks like the numbers shot up in New York, but the testing shot up in New York. So we don't really know. Hopefully, let's just keep our fingers crossed that maybe we've passed the hump already, but it could be months away. Could be months away. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, does anyone know? I'm, I know one of my, I don't want to announce what they're doing, but I know a couple different groups which are, are considering doing operas where. They sent. They have a recording of the accompaniment, and then sing, sending it out, and just having everyone sing their parts and sort of mixing it into things. Has anyone else heard any other sort of creative solutions? I mean, Zoom opera could certainly happen. Um, but what, what else is, have people heard of? I mean, that's already happening. Yeah, that's that is yeah. happening. <laughs> From the, I'm curious about other things that might might be happening. Does anyone know? Well, I know that does. In general, you know, video operas are a thing, and even a few years ago, there was a Twitter opera. Now, I That's right. <laughs> use Twitter as its way of, like, getting out, getting out there. Basically, use Twitter for its world premiere. Right, yeah, I think they broke it up into... I think they might have sourced it for the Red Award or, or something. Right, right. Does anyone remember that, too? It's, it's vaguely familiar. The Twitter source libretto? Yeah. Uh, vaguely. I don't remember what came of it. I remember the conversation about it, but I don't remember what the result was. Right. So th there's all sorts of ways to collaborate now uh, by a distance, but I can't wait to be in a room with people. <laughs> it's just such a different thing, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being in a space it makes all the difference, I think. Opera. Yeah. How, how are you doing, Brooke? Because you're, I mean, you're, you, you're living alone. You've, you've, you haven't, have, when, when was the last time you, you saw like a live human being? I went to get my mail 
in my lobby the other day and I uh -huh. saw one of my neighbors in the hallway <laughs> and I realized this the first time I'd seen a human being in many And you days. kissed him? Did you kiss him passionately? No, no, no. I, no? No. Oh. Social distance, oh. man. You don't kiss him. Oh, okay. Him. Right. No right. kissing. Walker, I, are you really oh, lonely okay. right now? But I was like, hi, hi, you're personal, hi. Um, I, <laughs> I, I think I, I, my biggest issue actually is that like if I live in an area where there is a park and there is a parkway. And I would like to go outside and walk and run on them, but my neighbors have not fully grasped the idea of social distancing. Yeah. So when I go outside, there's really no way for me to avoid other people. And so I've stopped going outside. Oh. Um, I mean, I mean, aside, for any, aside from when I need to. And it's, you know, not necessarily because I'm necess really worried about myself, but I don't want to perpetuate this thing that's happening in my neighborhood which is people just not doing what they're being told to do right and so greg to like stay right. out of it um and not bring germs into my building because again in my building there are lots of elderly people and i don't want to be a carrier of a terrible disease right um, and i know that greg you have a helper david who is helping us today uh, who is who is typing andrew. everything you say for our super uh, titles uh, uh, andrew uh, uh, andrew sorry uh, 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 and I saw Andrew is wearing a mask, which is completely socially responsible. My, my mom would do I have the good sense to point a few months back when she saw the way the wind really? was uh, when she saw the way things were going. So and I mean like Thankfully, I have a, I have a whole staff of helpers, not just Andrew, but they, but they live in uh, Jersey, they live in the Bronx, and, you know, because of public events, the they did, Andrew is literally the only person I can see because he lives to work the right. way they could for that because I wouldn't get any work done. Uh, right. So, yeah, that's true. Your helpers, if they would have, if they coming from the Bronx, you don't want them riding the subway. Um, yeah. And that was very smart of your mom to, to figure that out months ago. Um, yeah, yeah. So you live with your, your, your mom and, and dad, right? Yeah, yeah. With, I was in the same book. I know it's tough living alone, but you could be in quarantine with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Fair enough. <laughs> to, be, to, to be fair. To be fair. No one killed each other. No one killed anyone. Yes, but um, <laughs> there, there, are, there are some a few occasions where I have been uh, <laughs> so we can't I I am I you know like everything's a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. I have some friends who are trapped with their very very difficult children. Um, yeah. They love, but who are difficult. <laughs> and, Didn't talk about Walker like that. He's listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, like, I think if, if you say children, you don't have to add that they're difficult. If they're children. <laughs> they are difficult. There was Period. an amazing meme that I saw. Yeah. That was basically, like, hey, I haven't heard from those. Why yeah. aren't you a parent yet? Parenting is the best joy of my life. People have been a while. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, long. people, people, people are expecting a a baby boom um, oh. nine nine months from now, but but it's only going to be uh, new parents. Parents, yeah. <laughs> no, no one who already has kids because <laughs> that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so Walker, who are you who are you with? You're with your wife and and kids, and and there's four of you in that. In there's four of us. Yeah. 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 And and how are you guys dealing? I mean, it's. <laughs> First few days were pretty hard, um, but once you start getting into the, the the groove of the schedule, you just you just kind of get used to it. It's, it's, it's actually been getting a lot better. 
a uh, lot, lot of play time. You know, once, once the kids have their schedule, especially the three-year-olds, um, you just sort of fall into that schedule. I mean, luckily kids love to have a schedule. So if you can just get them in a schedule, then they will feel relaxed. You know, yeah, I, I live do, alone. They do their thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm alone in this, and I definitely schedule my playtime as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, Sarah, are you are you on your own or? No, it's uh, my husband and and me and our two cats. <laughs> so um, it's been uh, interesting because I'm I work from home every day, um, and then my husband James he has not like he would occasionally work from home one day a week. Um, but that's been a big shift from him now to working completely remotely. So we're all like trying to fight over who is in the living room at what time for certain conference calls and Zoom meetings. And, and uh, it's, it's been interesting adjusting to that because he is definitely a little more restless having not been used to working from home. So it, it's been a, a treat. Yeah, I think that's, this is a common story across the it's whole I, I am not, I am not well adjusted to being inside. I, I need to get, I need to be active. I need to, so it's, it's been really, really hard for me to adjust. Yeah, well, right now you look like the rum tum tugger from Cats, who really, <laughs> yeah. you, you kind of look like you want to go dancing and. Yeah, I think, I think I'm just going to grow a full like Brooklyn artisanal, you know, rustic beard. Um, getting their haircut anytime soon start yeah yeah, right i know what are people doing about haircuts i mean i keep saying that i'm gonna go full-on sinead o'connor at some point and just like take it all off i mean you guys are lucky because you have pretty short hair you know my my hair is getting really long i mean mean, brooke Brooke, you guys have kind of my hair's really long. I'm gonna be Your like pretty long. Nail by the time we get out of here. Yeah, but I can't. <laughs> I can't tie mine up in a bun. I, man bun. I, I, I don't want a man bun. So. <laughs> so does anyone? You know, we've been sitting on these lists of, of virtual things. Is there anything anyone's looking forward to sort of catching? Like I know that um, uh, the song from the uproar is going to be on um, um, Beth Morrison projects. And I, I know we had a good show on that, but I never got to see the show, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. Is there what anything? Is hmm. Song from the Upper. It's a Missy Mazzoli story. It's um, no when. <clears throat> oh, when is it? I think it's next week or this week. Okay. Soon. Well, who's doing Song from the Upper? Um, if you go to Beth Morrison Projects uh, oh. website. They are doing a different, they have various projects, but I know that they, they just showed Dog Days, which is like one of my favorites of all time. Oh, yeah, and I think the next thing is Song from the Uproar, but they're gonna have a whole bunch, they're gonna have a whole bunch of things. You should, def- I mean, they, they have I mean, good. I, I'm really looking forward to breaking the waves at them in June, hopefully it does not get, get canceled, yeah. And, but I, I really have a ticket, so I'm really interested to see some familiar ones to see the, you know, more, uh, more of the collaboration between Royce Belbrick and Missy Minoli. Yeah, I mean, they're really a dynamic duo. And uh, Song of the Emperor was, what, six, four years ago? Um, I th- was that the first thing they did together? I'm not sure. Now, um, the just in case people who are listening don't know about it, so, um, Breaking the Waves is an opera by Missy Mazzoli based on the Lars von Trier, is that right? Yes. Yeah, director. Um, wow, I'm amazed I remember that. Um, and the it's a really incredible performance. So they're doing it at BAM and with the Met Orchestra uh, be, uh, for the piece. They're also um, doing it in LA next season. And they're doing it in LA? This, LA is it the too. same production or is it a new? A no, I don't believe it's the same production. Sorry, did you say something, Greg? Oh, they're doing the amazing news. Yeah, definitely. And I'm curious to see, you know, how how it works in, that, in a, a larger space mm-hmm. like that. and and. Uh, with those kind of players, I'm really curious to see. You, you saw it when it was here before, right? Here. Yeah, I mean, they did it at uh, NYU's. Yeah. What's it called? I forgot. Skirble. The name. Yeah, Skirble. Right. It was. It was. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it really does deal with also the whole idea of someone who is in a wheelchair and physically constrained in sexuality. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I, I mean, I know you haven't seen it yet, Greg, but I would love to, no, uh, when I you've did, seen it. I, I did see the um, Skirbo performance. Oh, you did see the Skirbo. And yeah, what did, yeah, yeah, oh. Yeah. So what did you think of the issues of, of having someone who is physically unable to move and, and the representation on the stage? All right, well. I should say that that was my client, but. <laughs> Oh, so you can't, say, you can't say anything negative. First of all, the performance was a while ago, so looking for you, the clinic can't actually remember any of the uh, musical aspects of the performance. Right. Okay, here's my disclaimer in this. Okay. I, I, I do not pretend to like talk for the whole population of disabled people. I think it's a, I think it's a major step in the, in, uh, a good direction. I won't even say the right direction because I don't really know what that is. <laughs> okay. But, but it's, it's, it's when I first saw it years ago, my social life was different. My relationship to my disability was different, and I, I hated young. Uh, who is the guy who gets paralyzed in an accident? Not so much for the, the uh, idea he comes up with, namely to uh, have his wife go and have a bunch of sexual encounters with a man and tell him about it. Because uh, I understood it, and then the the need to get creative with intimacy with other disability. But he is I I honestly the best word I can think of is the dick. <laughs> uh, wow, well, that's true. Like I know like at the time and this is years ago, I thought like I would never put my wife through that. And now, like, having studied the piece a little bit more, especially recently, um, I, I still think he's a dick, but, <laughs> but I, 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 I realize now that he's really, you know, he's not someone sort of like me who has had uh, 29 years of life in a wheelchair to get used to it. Yeah, he, he was suddenly yeah. thrown into it. Like, sex is important to him as it is important to all of us. And it was just, he wanted to regain everything he was physically capable of uh, while still being in his new circumstance. So like that, I'm more sympathetic to him, but sorry, I still think he is uh, a dick. We're <laughs> we on the subject. And please stop me. I, I, I don't want to take too much time away from this, but I have a slight problem with 
branding just because being in a wheelchair is not something that you can necessarily expect divine grace to get you out of the literal physical sense. Yeah, you know, that's not also the first opera or theater piece that deals with a very serious problem and then at the very end sort of cheats its way out of it. Like the sex machina. Sex machina. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, but yeah, also, yeah. but I'm also thinking like Rent. Um, right. You know, Rent oh, oh. really made me angry because he, here someone sort of gets out of it, you know, oh, he's going to be okay. And it really didn't work out that way yeah, in real life, but, you know. Yeah. Do, you know do you understand what I'm saying? Bro? Yeah, yeah. And that, and, no, I totally agree with that. But. Yeah. I was going to say that I feel like the story really, like the, the, the character of Jan is really just a tool in telling the story that Lars von Trier wanted to tell about a woman sacrificing herself to redeem a man, which is a story that gets told over and over and over again in opera. And I am, as much as I love that opera, I am over that. <laughs> I yeah. don't need any more stories about women sacrificing themselves to redeem some asshole dude who got himself in his bad situation. Correct. <laughs> All right. Amen. <laughs> so, and so like the Jan was disabled was really just a plot device in in the movie, I feel like. And the opera is based on the movie. So I'm not yeah. holding the creators of the opera uh, responsible for that other than choosing to, to, set, to set this story. Mm. But um, but I find the story to be deeply disturbing on a on a level that is really just that all of these that, that none of these people are real people, and it's really just a, a story of magical redemption that serves patriarchy. That's it. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Out of fairness, with give credit where credit is due. And Peter, um, you, you get major props for changing my mind on this. Because I give the greatest props for telling a story which focuses on issues that a disabled couple faces in order to be a disabled couple. Peter uh, got, got really wise up to the point that, you know, even Porky and Bears didn't do that because, you know, in Porky and Bears, it's, it's about them being but them trying to be alone together, but they're never actually ever alone for a significant amount of time. Yeah, for you and Beth? Yeah, I, I'm blowing smoke on the ass, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> you're not the first, you're not the first, you won't be the last, <laughs> Greg. And <laughs> 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 so, yeah, like, I mean, I, 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 that's it, I really do like what you best for the way it portrays disability. I know it's controversial, but the way it portrays, you know, into the, uh, you know, with the way it portrays African American life. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, it's. I have to say, this is just a general point. A lot of the albums that I think do a really good job between disability, it's followed up in bad press for what they 
the, the bigger issues that they uh, fixed, like with the bit of Klingle, but I understand uh, the whole controversy regarding as well as better sitting in. But he just kicks ass, you know, like as a disabled character, you know, the way he stands up to the veterans and even uses foul language written into the libretto. It's really, really just kicks major ass. And like, I understand that, like, Daughters uh, of Mr. Klingover might be upset because it's their uh, father, you know, they have to relive that terrible, terrible tragedy. Yeah. But I really hope that people can at least take solace in the fact that as a disabled child, he just, he's really, you know, heroic. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't <clears throat> when I saw Klinghoffer, I actually didn't consider that I, the idea that he. <laughs> I mean, I do, I realized the character was kicking ass, but it wasn't in my head. I never thought of it as a representation of a handicapped person kicking ass. But that's really that's interesting. And, and this, this is the last thing I will say. Okay. <laughs> so just, just because you mentioned representation, I do not speak for. Everyone that's disabled, I'm sure people will disagree with me. They're totally welcome to. I don't need an actual disabled person on stage in order to consider that representation. I mean, a lot of what I consider part of living with a disability is, you know, Facing these big issues, big challenges that other people might find uh, trivial if you're able bodied whatever, in whatever comparison. The, the fact that it uh, puts, you know, these stories on stage of, of people, you know, just facing me larger in a way decisions and in those cases putting themselves last for whatever reason you know, that that is why I don't need you know I don't physically I don't really need a physical representation of a disabled character. If, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, I mean, the I, I'm hoping that these issues are common to everybody, <laughs> you know. And I, I also hoping that, uh, I mean, it's interesting how opera deals with the, the larger questions as well, um, whether or not someone is disabled or, or not. And actually, um, I'm kind of curious, do, have there been people on, on other parts of production that have had disabilities that I might not even know about. Like, are there compose are there any composers or or librettists that or operas that we know, Brooke or Sarah, that come from that world? Um, not all disabilities are visible, first yeah. of all. So we don't we wouldn't necessarily know. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a stupid question. I'll edit it out. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not a stupid it, question. It's not a, it's, it's, a, it's not a stupid question. I think it's not a, it doesn't have an obvious answer. It's yeah. not a stupid question. I just think recent um, needs, needs to be uh, done on, on this. Wait, just as long as it, you know, my thing with disability is on stage, you can do it, you can represent it 
However way it works, this is all that it makes sense. Yeah, as long as it works. It's like the old thing, the joke's funny, then it works, right? <laughs> show, one production yeah. that used um the last year i think it was new camarada opera there um was it rape of lucretia they had essentially a cast that was singing and then um or the the actors were i think um either deaf or using sign language and then they had other actors singing so they had um yeah. an interesting mix of um of of deaf and also hearing um, performers in that production, which I think um, brought a really interesting element to it. I wasn't able to go see the production. Brooke, were you able to go see that? I one? didn't see that, but I saw the King Lear that had a similar the, on Broadway where they had yeah. deaf actors and, and sign language. Right. Um, they also had a production of um, Spring Awakening recently okay. that, that had a mixed cast as well as was Big, was it Big River? Um, Oklahoma. 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 Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Do you think about that? Oklahoma was, Oklahoma was great because um, I, I, just, I, I didn't realize how absolutely thrilling it would be to have a cute girl in a wheelchair sing about how She's the girl who can't say no. When that, when that, when that happens, like I, 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 I'm a musical, so like I knew what to expect. In Oklahoma, it wasn't like I was going into it, but. The, it was really exhilarating when uh, when she came out as Ada Lanny and, and did the thing I was like, yes, we will arrive. <laughs> yeah. You won a Tony too, right? Like she, she yeah. Was, yeah, she won the Tony. Yeah. She won, yeah. She won the Tony, which I'm very happy she did win the Tony. Um, but after she won the Tony, it just seemed like the ad campaign for it centered around, you know, what they call in my in the disability field the uh, installation porn. Inspiration porn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean it yeah. is it is like, yeah, exploit yeah. exploitive. That's what you're with, saying. With, I, I mean, with, I understand that this is probably the only disabled acting to win it, though. I'm not trying to, to um, you know, minimize the couple's that know even the fact that being the first one, you know, um, she might, you might as well. From a production standpoint, capitalize on it. It would just be nice to one day get to a point where you could say, come see Tony Winner, Ellie Silver, and have that be that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not have to include that. Now, Sarah, I bet you represented Oklahoma too, didn't you? No, I don't have anybody. Okay. <laughs> just opera folks just <laughs> classical musicians but did anybody watch um encore on on disney plus has anybody watched that yet no tell so me they go back <laughs> if you did musicals in high school then you will love it because what they do is they go back to uh and they assemble the cast from like the 1998 high school production of beauty and the beast at this high school or like the 1980 something senior class production of like Godspell. And they get these original cast members now who've gone on to all these other things in their lives back for like five, only five days of rehearsal to remount their productions. But they bring in like Broadway directors, choreographers, like they bring in some like 
some like chorus extra folks to like fill in holes for some of the like chorus and stuff like that and it's it's charming but also so one of these high schools did Oklahoma and the guy who played Will um, had I I can't quite remember if he had had an accident and was now in a wheelchair and they actually brought Allie in to have like a special session with him to kind of like figure out some sort of choreography and and kind of show him how she moves around the stage really well and uh, and the choreographer made a point of you know like Will has a big tap dance that he's supposed to do in the show and he originally did it like when they did the musical obviously wasn't able to do it in the exact same way but the choreographer really worked with him to like use the chair use his hands in place of his feet and and really kind of like still give him that same sort of experience and that was it was really neat that's a great idea that's a yeah. great idea have, have you have idea you, of that show yeah, i just randomly found it one day and then like of course watched all the episodes oh that's amazing <laughs> it's really so have, have have you um represented a, a disabled performer before or do, do you know anything no, about what it what it's and how what it's like no i mean i we don't have that I know of any any visible physical disabilities, you know, I'm sure there are probably folks who, um, you know, everybody has either mental health or, you know, other other things that they're working with that like either they don't, you know, they don't have to share with us, you know, like that's not our business unless they want it to be our business. Um, you know, learning disabilities, I'm sure people learn music in different ways, but but we have not um, worked with any any, I mean, I guess, Okay, so I guess this technically counts. Weston Hurt, he's, he's missing part of part of an arm. Um, so, I mean, I, sh I shouldn't say never. You can edit that out to be like, yes, actually. Um, but I think about like the level of, um, I guess, the, the scale. Um, and Weston, actually, he doesn't even use his, like he has a prosthetic that sometimes productions will use. Um, it kind of depends on what the director once um, they've done, he's done a Tosca um, and also a Traviata where they've specifically asked to not use um, the prosthetic. Um, like as a uh, German, he was more of like, they cast him as sort of like a war hero. So like, like a civil war, war hero. So they had the sleeve of his jacket pinned up. Um, and I think if I remember in a production of Tosca he was in, um, during act two, they asked him to like remove the prosthetic in like oh. a really interesting and, and potentially like creepy sort of way. Was he Scarpia? Yes, he was the Scarpia. It offends you? No, it excites me. It excites you. <laughs> for, for, for many reasons. Um, <laughs> the, and, uh, some, some of them I can't do that. I feel comfortable riffing on it. I don't feel comfortable riffing on it. But, but, but like, yeah, it just, it, 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 it really, in, in I always say that uh, if someone could uh, design the production of Don Giovanni that uh, the dog could be in a wheelchair, I would sing in it and or watch it in a, in a heart. Uh, That's so cool. Well, let's put it out there. That's a great idea. Yeah. Don Giovanni in a wheelchair would be a yeah. really interesting production. Yeah. Walker, Walker. <laughs> I would I'd love to direct that. That'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really inventive chair choreography. <laughs> actually, actually, it would be great for a Baroque. Because uh, Baroque has such like, like, like a 20 mil. Like imagine, you know. You know, you could, you could, yeah, yeah, but it, it, it would yeah. be great for someone to be in a wheelchair to like really like and navigate to, the stage. And to bring it back to Tosca, Tosca, where actually 
work with a disabled developer quite well because they share the bunch of times that you can hear this one is allowed to do his bidding. So like that, that would actually work. He could just wander around his minions. Wander around his minions. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I <It's like, laughs> <laughs> Minions. Around. <laughs> I, I use that. I use that term a lot. Minion. Do you, you <laughs> call your your health aids minions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. How do you feel about that? About that, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew. Uh, used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Flattered in a way. Flattered in a way. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I, about Weston just really quickly um, and he's he's talked about this publicly um, like his decision whether or not he wants to like wear his prosthetic like on stage or even in auditions um, you know about like whether or not people casting are comfortable with that sort of idea and and Alex and I have always told him like do whatever makes you feel most comfortable like if you don't want to wear it you shouldn't have to wear it like it's who you are and um like if people are going to try and begrudge you a role because of it then obviously that's not probably somebody we want to, we want to be working with anyway yeah. um but i we've not found it an issue in casting him um i don't think at all um in fact the the more creative directors obviously are finding great ways to either you know work with that or or not um you know, and some productions do have him just use the prosthetic, which looks as realistic as like any, like you can't, you can't tell the difference at all. It's like crazy realistic. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been an interesting discussion point in, um, you know, asking, him, you know, seeing if he wanted to wear that for auditions and him deciding he didn't want to. So like, again, that goes back to all those younger singers just telling them to do what they're most comfortable with doing in in audition settings you know like to not let something like a physical disability get in your way right has, has he ever refused to to do something that a that, that a director wanted him to do in, in a production not that i know of i mean he may have other stories i mean we've only been working with him the last few years there may be other stories from before my time but not not that uh not that i'm aware of <laughs> Well, guys, that's great. I mean, I, I hope that there's even more performers, you know, who who have, you know, whatever type of disability who are who are being encouraged by, you know, by this and like putting themselves out there. I hope, you know, but I mean, both both in theater and in opera. So I hope I hope that that's a wave that we're going to see, you know, in, in coming years more more and more. So thank you, everyone. I think that, uh, you know, this has been a great show. And I'm so glad to have Sarah and Greg on with us. Greg, we'll have you on again sometime. It was just real cool to have you on. And Sarah, thank you so much for, for your perspective and humor. Um, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. And um, wait, did someone say what? 90 seconds to ask everybody what they're watching. What they're oh, doing. really? What you're, you know, I don't know what, what I'm watching, watching right now. Just what they're streaming. I'm, I'm too busy to watch anything. I'm writing an article on dialogue with the Kremlin for the... Oh. Well, so Greg's putting <laughs> all the rest of us who watch TV to shame right now. What are you writing an article on what? Dialogue with the Kremlin. The, 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 dialogue? The, oh my god. Actually, I, 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 I am wanting something. I am wanting the... Mindy project when I go to bed at night because you need something to wash down all that decapitation. And and you just marathon the Lord of the Rings. I'm gonna. Oh my up. gosh. Okay. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> that and takes a lot of stamina. We uh, marathon it because you can. I mean, where am I going to go? And I am. <laughs> and the said he would disown me if because uh, I said I had never seen it. So <laughs> I was like, well, if they're going to disown me, then we best fix that. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, guys, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, uh, Walker and, and Sarah, is there anything that you're looking forward to seeing or streaming? I'm not ashamed to admit that I binged Tiger King. Um, oh. so now it's it's on to the next thing, I guess. Have you guys? I, I'm just Tiger I'm King? just watching art films, art films, and uh, I watched the Contempt, the Godard films. Really amazing. If you haven't seen it, you, you must it live out. in Brooklyn. I am not that cool. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys, if you have not watched Tiger King, oh my God, you have to watch Tiger King. And what is it? What? What it's a documentary. It's like seven episodes documentary about people who keep big game. Oh yes. In their yards, ostensibly. It's, it's, it's on Netflix. Movie. Yes. It's on Netflix, yes. it is insane. The fact that these people <laughs> all own like tigers is the most normal thing about them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, Netflix should be our sponsor. That's oh my should, God. You hit them up. Definitely, like Tiger King. Yeah, you should definitely. And you can watch it. it. It's seven episodes. You can watch it in a day if you. I just, I it. just love that guy's haircut. I mean, his, his, his beard That's and his hair. hair is like pretty like soon. I'm going to have the same. Amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good Bye. one. Good Bye, everyone. And we're going to have more resources on the website. I, I keep putting up things uh, related to COVID-19, as well as things small companies can do. I, we keep getting stuff from uh, Opera America. Uh, and please check out the New York, uh, uh, New York Virtual Opera Fest, uh, which, we'll have, which is on the same website as New York Opera Fest. Um, and Brooke, it looks like you're raising your hand. No, I'm just. It's a <laughs> hand. <laughs> That's his hand I just wasn't sure if you wanted to add something. No, I, just, I just needed to be in a different position. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. And maybe we'll record one uh, sooner than a month again. Yeah. All Why right. Okay. Yeah. And anyone who's listening, one. who's a fan or, or who has been on the show before and want to tell us what amazing things are happening to them in their sequestered yeah, lives. Please, anybody, send in a little video of what you're doing. Maybe we'll put it in the episode, in our episodes. And, uh, and right at the end here, we're going to add two short videos from uh, our previous customers, our previous show, Arnold and Shabrell, who uh, are, have sent us two short videos to give us an update on how they're faring since our last show. So we'll put that on the end here. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Bye. For watching. Oh. For watching. Have Thanks a good for night. Watching. Good night. Thanks for watching. <laughs> hey guys, Shabrell Williams here, just uh, here to give you a little check in on what's going on since the, I guess, March 16th uh, when we had our first podcast with you guys, me and the Opera Podcast. Um, uh, stuff has changed. Uh, we're no longer set to open the show on April 13th. Um, instead, now I think they're opening the show up in the fall. Uh, there's been no date, um, no set date for the show, but we will be back stronger than ever in the fall. Uh, other than that, I think anything else that's changed is I'm no longer in New Jersey. I am in Houston, Texas. Now back home with my hubby and my puppy. Um, I am self-quarantining pretty hard because I did have to fill out a form um, leaving uh, after I left New Jersey from the airport and landed here in Houston. So I sort of on a mandatory self-quarantine. But uh, I was already sort of doing that when I first arrived in Houston you know, on the 17th day after the podcast um but guess i gotta do another one so things are weird still but enjoying the social distancing <laughs> all right i uh, hope you guys have a great day night whenever you receive this i'm not sure but uh yeah have a good one bye <laughs>
seems like a lot has changed, you know, not only with um, what we talked about last time, but the entire world. So I hope you guys are doing all right. Um, uh, I hope you guys are moving around and keeping busy and, and keeping your heads up. Um, just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an encouragement. You know, I think it'll all be over soon. And, and um, yeah, it's it's hard to, to keep our heads up, but I think that We'll be able to pull through this all together and um yeah i just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update on where i'm at right now um so as you may have heard intimate apparel has been officially postponed until next fall for uh, the lincoln center theater season of 2020 to 2021 so hopefully we'll be back in august september of this year to uh, actually get some performances of the show um and uh yeah other than that it, it looks like all of my summer work has been canceled as i know maybe a lot of yours has and um yeah it's been hard but um you know i'm filling the time with uh i've been writing music and uh, some lyrics and also I've been uh, working with the church choir uh, that actually um, airs on a TBN network. Uh, it's called the Hour of Power. So we're doing this virtual choir sort of thing. We've been producing our own audio and video for that, which has been fun and interesting. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep busy. I've been teaching lessons online. If you want to get a lesson, hit me up, arnoldlivingstontenor at gmail.com. I've been doing Skype lessons and, and things like that. And um, yeah, just making it work, just like we all have to during these rough times. Um, but uh, yeah, so I have a little uh, music that I've been writing, and actually all the music that you'll hear on this on this video um, is original stuff that I've been working on, and that's been really fun um, doing some music production. And um, yeah, I hope you guys like it. Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that I need to update you guys on. Yeah, just keep singing, guys. Um, uh, love you all. Thanks for tuning in. Ciao. Could you stop what you're doing and please subscribe to our show on YouTube? That way you will be notified of all our video shows. And please rate our show in whatever app you're listening or watching us on. It's a free way to show your support. If you want to help bring opera to a new generation of listeners, one great way is to go to patreon.com and become our patron. This episode of the Indie Opera Podcast was recorded on Zoom and is produced by Peter Zepp with co-hosts Walker Lewis and Brooke Larimer and with special guests Sarah Frazier and Gregory Mumji. Our show is created with the support of associate producer Chuck Sachs and Rosha Crean, who wrote our theme music. This episode was edited by me, Peter Zepp. Thank you for watching.